Ani, bujo, tanzi, sega, welcome everyone. My name is Nochmoen Mushkogiyash, better known as Philip Kote III. I belong to the Underwater Panther Clan and I'm also a band member of Moose Deer Point First Nations. Today, I'm here to share with you a traditional land acknowledgement. Artworks TO, Toronto's Year of Public Art 2021, and the City of Toronto would like to acknowledge our presence on the land that has been the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee peoples since time immemorial. And in 1805, with the signing of the Toronto Purchase, is now the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. As we reach back to those first Torontonians, we remember our Mother Earth through the Seven Grandfather teachings, wisdom, bravery, respect, honesty, truth, humility, and love. The stories of each of these nations endure and continue to guide our thoughts and actions on this land. And as we acknowledge our Mother Earth, we acknowledge the Medicine Wheel and its teachings, we recognize the four directions, north, south, east, and west, and the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. It is these four seasons that represent the circle of life. Nindanoe Maganida, which means all my relations, which means we are all related. Aho, miigwech matakuyasin. For joining us this evening. My name is Rebecca Carbon. I'm principal and founder of Art Plus Public Unlimited, and I've been working with the incredible Artworks TO team on several aspects of the Artworks TO program, including uh, this series of talks. I'm excited to be back here with you this evening for our final chapter of the Artworks TO talk series. This evening is our first of two talks titled Setting the Table. I'd like to thank Stella Artois for supporting these talks. Stella Artois is Artworks TO's official beer sponsor and wants to help Toronto's audiences make sure they make time for the important things in life like art and good company. Uh, and to make sure you enjoy your personal time after work time. So thank you for kicking that off with us today um, with the Artworks Live at Five talk. Um, I'm excited to be back here with you for our ninth, that is our second to last or penultimate episode of the Artworks TO talk series Live at Five. Our RixTO is a full year of public art programming unfolding across the City of Toronto that aims to greatly diversify the opportunities for artists and audiences to engage in art. We have over 1,400 artists involved in this program and more than 300 new installations, murals, screenings, performances, and events. The program kicked off in the last quarter of 2021, and it's unfolding in a really exciting way across uh, 2022 until September of this year. Um, over this past year, Artworks TO Live at Five has highlighted some practices, some projects uh, within Artworks TO, among many other uh, amazing public art initiatives taking place around town this and every year. Uh, Live at Five is a series of talks mm -hmm. about some overarching issues within public art practices today, loosely, ar loosely arranged around the ideas of art and health. So we've been examining five themes over 10 events. And over the course of the series, we've looked at art and emerging from the pandemic, um, how artist practices have adopted to public spaces, community building and wellness through the arts, gathering, sharing experiences, positive impacts of art in public space, all access, how do questions about access and accessibility inform a conversation about how public art comes to be in a place, to what end and for whom. Uh, and then our last two uh, um, talks before this one were defining a monument landscape for the future, in which we included an overview of the Artworks TO project uh, with Monument Lab, which has resulted in policy recommendations regarding key aspects of the city's public art and monuments collection. And that was in dialogue with a number of artists uh, practicing in pushing the definition of monuments uh, within our city. So the conversations today have been really rich and inspiring, and I'm so pleased that we're all they were all recorded. And they live online in the Artworks TO on-demand library. So our hope is that they will kind of continue to exist as a valuable resource for people interested in the various aspects 
uh, that intersect with art and health. Um, tonight, we're going into the first of two chapters titled Setting the Table. As we emerge from isolation, we're all welcoming the opportunities to come together in person. And our ability to share ideas, communicate concepts, myths, and stories is actually what makes us human. The phrase, the common phrase, breaking bread, is, a, is a one that refers to coming together and sharing food, both food and ideas. And the expression, uh, breaking eggs to make an omelet, is actually one of my favorites, um, that refers to needing to break the status quo or make a, make a bit of a mess in order to make something new. These are phrases that speak to experimentation and they speak to that in both, uh, and both art and good cooking are about working within rules and known experiences to push boundaries on the creative side and then on the receiving side, as an audience uh, for art or as a guest at a meal, both are about a shared language of describing our world and the interrelation of experience, uh, experiences of existence. So possibilities, ideals, values, and politics are things that we communicate through art, and they are also things we explore through food and that we share around a table. Talks 9 and 10 will present conversations between chefs who push uh, their culinary skills into an art form and artists who work with food to create dialogue about our shared experiences. So first, a couple of housekeeping uh, notes before I hand over to our amazing moderator. Uh, we're live for a brief 60 minutes together. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to type your questions for the panelists in the comments section. We will have a question period near the end of the hour. And if you want to rewatch this video again and again later, it will be on the on demand uh, in the Artworks TO on demand library. Um, so without further ado, our, our moderator this evening is Chef Karima. Chef Karima is a first-generation Canadian of Trinidad and Tobago descent. Karima has over 20 years in the hospitality industry. Her tagline is, Mom made me cook, had me cooking since the 80s. And she combines her love for Caribbean flavors with her passion for culinary cuisine to create unique tastes of the world. She continues to feed her food vocabulary and passion for cooking. Chef Karima seasons her culinary creations with her fun-loving, energetic personality, which you will get a taste of this evening, and adds her unique touch to every single dish she makes. Throughout the years, her palate for flavors has diversified, and she incorporates flavors from the Caribbean and North America to feed her love of unique dishes. Karima creates culinary masterpieces using ingredients ranging from the classic to exotic. Over to you, Chef Karima. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi, hi. So we're going to introduce Noah. So... I'm going to read her bio. Noah's very interesting. So Noah uh, Bronstein is a creator and writer based in Toronto. Her practice is often focused on the social production of space and thinking through how artists just disrupt and subvert systems, including those registering across social, political, and economic structures. Most recently, most recently sorry, Noah has held the positions of executive director of Gallery 44, Center for Contemporary Contemporary Photography, inaugural senior curator at the Small Arms Inspection Building in Mississauga, and project manager at the Art Gallery of Ontario, AGO for short. She is currently the executive director of Gallery TPW. Noah, please share more. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you for that introduction. And thank you for um, inviting me to join today. I really appreciate being in dialogue with all of you. Um, so I'm gonna focus on place settings, um, which is a public art project I'm guest curating for Critical Distance Center for Curators. This is a project that started in 2019 and has really shape-shifted many times before arriving at, I would say, a still in process series of works and conversations uh, that continues throughout this summer. And I just want to take a moment before I continue to thank the Critical Distance team for supporting this project and being such incredible partners throughout. Uh, focusing specifically on the intersections of food, public space, and architecture, place settings points to formal and informal structures that offer forms of nourishment, be they physical, emotional, social, or political. Um, is there a way to put on my slideshow? Oh, there we go. Um, so place settings uh, is very much in keeping with another curatorial project that I developed or started to develop around the same time in 2019, which was exhibited at the Small Arms Inspection Building and various sites across Mississauga. Uh, the project titled Public Volumes referenced the concept of spatial justice, which is a theory that acknowledges the connection between space and justice as integral to understanding how we arrive at our relationships. 
spatial justice recognizes that how space is organized um, reflects social realities and injustices that profoundly impact on our lived experiences. But whereas spatial justice tends to be framed in terms of urban planning, public volumes suggested that bringing together ideas connected to space and justice is more meaningfully, can be more meaningfully, meaningfully realized across wider frameworks. So in reframing spatial justice more openly, the artists within this exhibition and programming series made visible how space is felt, used, lived in, and challenged. Um, and these spatial insights shifted the focus towards the many communities that emerge in, around, and by way of space. Um, and public volumes was unfinished in some ways, um, which led to a desire to continue to think spatially through the lens of artistic practices. So from here, place settings has emerged uh, not so much as a series of discrete artworks, um, but more so as a series of punctuations and experiments with not just food related works, but with what constitutes a public artwork, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so place settings addresses wide ranging concerns through installations and programs engaging with systems of food distribution and consumption through their spatial forms. The multiple points of engagement realized through this project are really intended to speculate on the potentials of public sharing and social transformation at the center of food-focused arts programming. Um, through artistic practice and critical inquiry, this project is meant to be a sustained exploration of the possibilities that might emerge when we resist the idea that food is purely transactional, which is something that's shared with a lot of projects, I think, and instead consider uh, the complex entanglements of space and sustenance. So like food itself, this project is really inseparable from the wider ecology in which it is produced. Um, it certainly finds itself situated within a spectrum of food-focused arts programming here locally in Toronto and well beyond recognizing the shared questions and urgencies of these various programs is really central to this project. And I think like many artists and curators, um, food-focused programming is compelling to me because of the openings that it supports into considerations around sharing, collectivity, ideas around sustenance and nourishment and so on. Um, but one of the interests that really kind of compelled me um, towards this project is that I think it's fair to say that there is a fair amount of food programming um, that is about intimacy and interiority, although of course not exclusively, um, even when shared within the kind of semi-public space of the Art Gallery Museum. And I'm really interested um, in our relationships to how with food um, are equally informed by very public spaces, including city streets and urban landscapes. And again, I'm not alone in this, um, but that's sort of where my interests were with this project. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an image of Morris Lum's billboard project from last summer's place settings. Um, this is an image of Forest View Chinese restaurant from 2011, which closed in 2014. So Morris and I saw this as a memorial of sorts, signaling a changing Chinatown as it, as it adapts to external gentrifying forces. And this image is very much in keeping with Morris's practice of documenting shifting Chinatown landscapes. And I'm just going to quote him briefly here. Uh, Since 2012, I've been searching for clusters of Chinatown communities that have been built across Canada and the United States for the purpose of settlement and growth. My aim is to focus and direct attention towards the functionality of Chinatowns and to explore the generational context of how Chinese identity is expressed in these structural enclaves. Armed with a large format camera, I've documented Chinatowns in Victoria, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Halifax, San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and Boston. I've often traveled back and forth to these Chinatowns to record the rapid architectural and economic changes that these communities have been facing. The images are visual records of dynamic cityscapes in which I highlight historical and contemporary cultural fixtures, such as small mom and pop shops, Chinese restaurants, and community organizations. Uh, next slide. I think I have another image. Yeah. Um, so turning the Forest View Chinese restaurant space inside out and displaying it so publicly speaks to Morris's ongoing interest in acknowledging sites that feed us socially and nutritionally. 
Um, and it similarly speaks to spaces that build community and connection through food and that space and food reinforce one another in the generating of social experiences and connections. Uh, so taking a very different approach, um, part of Karen Tam's project in place settings last summer involved questioning what constitutes a public artwork. Uh, Karen's project was concerned with planter boxes, um, balcony gardens and community gardens and how these structures outpace their humble forms, um, often connecting us to fresh food and culturally specific food and to networks of care that often develop around these kind of unassuming structures, especially within urban context. Uh, next slide, please. So, I'm sorry, this image is, is somewhat terrible, um, but uh, so Karen contacted T-Base, uh, who, who you may be familiar with. Um, they described themselves as a curious community art space tucked away in Toronto's Chinatown Centre Mall uh, to collaborate. And she suggested building planter boxes with them um, within Chinatown as part of her public artwork. Um, T-Base though was already using an existing structure you see here at Chinatown Centre Mall to grow and tend to a garden. And they had a lot of community days where people would harvest um, uh, the, food that, the food that was grown, the herbs that were grown and so on. So part of Karen's project was to share part of her artistry and her own seed, own seed collection um, that she had been collecting through various family members and her own growth growings. Um, so to share that with T-Base um, so that they could simply continue to tend to their own garden and space. So this gesture really was meant to kind of open into the possibilities of how we might rethink public art towards supporting existing community-led spaces and initiatives rather than a kind of presumed need to create something new. Um, and this is, of course, not at all to suggest that new works are not crucial within kind of our cultural landscape and, and um, physical landscapes, but it is to say that alternative possibilities are also worth exploring and sort of have, can have their own generative potential. Um, so I will close it at that and pass it on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Noah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> that was uh, that was actually interesting. Thank you. Okay, so now we have Rhonda and Trevor. <clears throat> they're, they're based in New York and Toronto, respectively. I'll find out who's where later. Um, they have worked together since 2004. Their work has been um, increasingly incorporated in communal aspects of craft, such as DIY, tutorial videos, and virtual crafting bees. Oh, I need to know about that too. Their recent video tutorial project, Crafts Abyss, was hosted by the Museum of Arts and Design at NYC. The work is in collection, sorry, their work is in collections, including the National Gallery of Canada, Ottawa, the, Va the Vancouver Art Gallery, and the Muse. I don't want to mess it up. I didn't do well in French. <laughs> So if you guys could say that one. Uh, Montreal. Thank you. <laughs> <There> you <go. laughs> they were awarded the, the 2014 Glenn uh Prize and the 2022 L. Odette Sculpture Residency at York University. They are represented by a Susan Hobbs Gallery in Toronto. Trevor, Rhonda, there you go. Oh. <laughs> thank you very so much. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you. Thank you for the intro. Sorry for the words there that are. So thank, thank you, you for including Trevor yeah. and I on this panel discussion. Um, and we're going to start off by, oh, and to say I split my time between Toronto and New York City and Trevor lives in Etobicoke. So um, we're going to talk about the Guest Shadow, which is a series of food related light installations supported by Art with TO and is happening this summer and fall across 10 parks in Toronto. And so Toronto, sorry, Trevor and I are mostly sculptors and make a wide range of work. And one thread of our work is temporary public sculpture as a dreamy, surreal and displaced everyday thing. So this first piece is called Sugar Mountain and it was in front of the Toronto Beaches Library during the height of the pandemic last year. And it is a displaced baker case that is lit by its cakes instead of the case lighting the, the cakes. And they are based on cakes that I worked at a bakery for four years in Burlington, Ontario, and uh, the model on cakes which were sold at that bakery. So it, it's we just showing is there's a whole series of these kind of projects we've done that are these kind of bubbles, kind of displaced bubbles, these fragile bubbles that are sort of out on the city street temporarily. So it's just kind of some uh, 
form of working that we've uh, developed initially actually for a new Blanche project called All Night Convenience in 2012. And that was a, a transparent convenience store. Um, we went around to different uh, um, convenience stores in Toronto and bought, uh, you know, kind of made an archive of things that were on sale. And we photographed them in the round, the real products. We photographed them in the round and turned them into these transparent lanterns. Each one is a light and the store is lit by the products. And then over the course of a Nuit Blanche event, uh, people come into the store, they take the products for free, they make a choice, they kind of do a shopping and you can watch them do it. And then the store goes dark, it vanishes, but the project doesn't actually vanish, it just transforms into something else. It dissipates and it becomes a very diffuse cloud and all the lanterns are in different people's homes or floating around the city. Um, so we've done it in many different cities and we go to the city, we buy, we create an archive of our products from that city. Uh, this is Dallas, um, this one is Toledo, and we kind of adopt conventions of naming from those areas and so on. So that's kind of the background of the guest shadow that we're doing for Artworks TO. And for the guest shadow, um, we wanted to do something that was a little more imp improvisatory because those previous things I showed, they, can en they ended up kind of evolving into being these monster productions that were kind of, and we kind of wanted to go back to something that was just kind of plopped out on the, on the, in a park or something uh, and could vanish and appear in a moment's notice. So instead of uh, convenience store foods, we started uh, collecting and photographing uh, picnic foods, started with a lot of iconic picnic foods. This is how they look with lights in them. So they're all lanterns, they're photographs in the round. We did a test of it at the University of Connecticut and it, the way the project works is at dusk, we sort of lay out the blanket and it starts, the first one started with just our uh, picnic basket, which is also a lantern, it's a photograph. And then people uh, come to the site, uh, stumble upon it or they, they hear about it. And we have lantern kits that they can take. There's a kind of menu you can order from the menu. There's French fries, strawberry shortcake and so on and so on. And you get a kit when you show up. And in it is a lantern that you can take at, and make at home. And then there's another lantern that you can just finish it and put a light in it and leave it on the blanket. So here's people doing that activity. Uh, and the blanket builds up and all the lanterns are a kind of record of the visitors. They're the, this light is the guest, each guest shadow. Uh, and this, this sort of uh, potluck emerges. It's hodgepodge and it becomes this kind of beacon you know, that's out in the middle of nowhere uh, and then just vanishes. So for Toronto, uh, we're doing 10 of these and it grows with each picnic. So we, we lanterns are added by people and it grows and grows and grows at each site. Um, and there's a website that you can go to the guestshadow.com and it has a list of where the events are, but it also has, uh, you can go and download the lanterns, for example. So we do a lot of work where we're dis distributing source files for what we make and people can make them and copy them and do whatever they want. Um, you can also submit recipes and that's, we, we collect recipes and they start to change the flavors of the picnic, so to speak. And we uh, solicit recipes or people send them to us. We actually cook them. Then we prepare the dish, we photograph it in the round and we turn it into a lantern and it becomes part of the picnic. And then other people can print it out or they can make the recipe. You can make a representation of it or you can cook it. Uh, so here's a pakora recipe. That's my stove. I did the best I could. Uh, this is the dish. There's the digital file that we created from it. And there is how it's assembled as a lantern and then a light will go in it and go onto the picnic. Dan and Etobicoke, the first one was right across the street from my house uh, in Carsbrook Park. And he submitted this roast, which I served to my family at Christmas. And then the leftovers I turned into this digital file and that became part of the picnic. We have a lot of partners that we use, not just city parks, but uh, one of our partners is the Artist Cookbook by uh, Carrie Perot. Now, picnic is a very common theme in art. I mean, if you think of Impressionist paintings, you probably think of a few picnics, uh, and you think about people gathering and having a kind of discussion. Maybe it's a little bit like a kind of salon, I suppose, that appears and vanishes. So we're using, these are recipes um, by a Canadian artist, a lot of them Toronto artists, uh, that Carrie's collected and we're we're cooking a lot of these recipes as well and using them in the picnic as this reference to the art community. Uh, this is a boiled orange cake uh, which was actually 
quite delicious. We photographed it. We haven't turned it into a lantern yet, but you get the idea. So these become part of it. Uh, otherwise, people just send us, you know, like recipe cards. This is me as coconut tapioca squares recipe. It's next on the slate to be cooked and turned into a lantern. So you can get these recipes at our website. So we another one of our partners was Artscape Gibraltar. Rhonda, do you want to pop in? Yep. Uh, okay. So this is a second iteration. And thanks to Nicholas Argawal, uh, the manager of Artscape Gibraltar Point, we were able to use the center there outside and inside. And because we had access to inside, we ran a workshop, actually two workshops, where it was just free to people to self-serve, make lanterns that are based on traditional Japanese bamboo and, bamboo and tissue lanterns. So it's just instructions laid out and we sort of wander around and people show up. Um, uh, Louisa Milan at the center uh, actually graciously uh, donated this cake for inspiration and for us to eat. And here are the, some sample cakes, uh, cake lanterns. So about 50 people showed up uh, for the two workshops. Uh, and, and we enjoy having these workshops to prolong engagement with the piece. People get to talk to each other uh, or just have a moment to be creative. Um, here are some examples of the people going through the stages and making it. Some people spend an hour, you can do one very quickly, or you can spend six hours like one person did. <laughs> Uh, and you can adapt the projects to whatever way you would like to adapt them to. You have a shark cake slice. <laughs> so actually what these workshops are, our pieces are, our work is always evolving. As you can see, there's these light pieces becomes this, becomes that, becomes the next thing. And it kind of grows and it, and we're interested in the idea of people interacting with it and changing where it goes and what it is. So, you know, here we're testing different ways of making the lanterns and also people creating designs, people creating different shapes. Uh, and turning it into something different. And that's actually kind of partly what we're interested in as we, as we take it out and random things happen in the real world in public space. So this is, the, this is being finished up here with a layer of wax. And then at the very end, after the workshops and the sun starts setting, this is the one that took six hours. Uh, here's a few other ones. That one. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then as the sun starts setting, we had the uh, guest shadow set up next to the center so people could put their cake slice lantern into the uh, piece. Um, they could also take it home at, at the end as well. And here people started gallering around and enjoying the piece outside. And then because we made some connections during the workshop, uh, we got to show the piece again on the other side of the island now at Ward's Island. Um, where we hosted another workshop, which is, we adapted every time to suit the space. Um, it was an outdoor workshop during nightfall, so uh, much more simple, just using paper, and these are pasta noodles that are glued on or to look like icing. Uh, some markers, so all the stuff was all done. So, and we had um, cookies, I made some cookies there, and there's some hot chocolate. So again, trying to prolong people's engagement, and this was sort of a surprise one, so whoever walked by would see it and come join the activity. It becomes this kind of social thing. And I think it's a little bit about, you know, representation and, and mimicry, mimicking things and, and using improvised materials to reconstruct the world and make a picture of the world. So here's some, some folks that just thump, just walking by, just were tourists. They had no idea this was going on. We spent about an hour and a half with them. Uh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, uh, so it's tra oh, Trevor, sorry, sorry, we have one minute left, so it just kind of okay. wrap up. So it just, it's going through different parks. We, we do the workshops in different ways. These ladies, for example, live in the same building. They never met each other until this moment. So lots of conversations happen and people goofing around with materials and, and, uh, do, and creating these depictions of, of a shared feast. And uh, young people, old people, uh, just every demographic you can think of. And the picnic becomes this hodgepodge of food that some of it goes together, some of it maybe not, olives and brownies and whatever, becomes this cacophony of food and representations and uh, gets gnarlier and gnarlier. So the last one we'll do in the fall, it'll probably be four or five times this size and uh, we'll give them all away at the last event. And as we go, the lanterns transform uh, and become gnarlier and gnarlier. And a lot of them show food that's half eaten or they have uh, incorporate ideas of, you know, flies on them or different conventions of still life or the ideas of ants at a picnic and so on. Um, so if you want to come to the next one, come and see us August 6th at Witchwood Barnes Park. It's tentatively scheduled and uh, it's at 9 p.m. sunset. And also visit us, give us a recipe because we're really looking for recipes to grow the project. So you can do it at our, Rhonda at our weppler.com or go to the guestshadow.com. And that's our spiel presentation. Thank you, Rhonda and Trevor. 
I, I, I love that. I can't wait for a question part. So, <laughs> okay. So next up is Jess. Uh, Jess is a professionally trained pasta chef in Toronto. Jess, we're going to be friends. Um, she worked across the industry at Midfield Wine Bar, Al Alimentary. Did I say that right? Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence Restaurant, Montreal, Paris, Paris, and most recently, Woodlot Restaurant. When all restaurants shut in March of 2020, Jess started making fresh pasta kits and offering delivery. From there, Pasta Forever was born. After offering delivery and virtual classes for one and a half years, Jess opened her first brick and mortar store at 1693 Dundas Street West in Toronto, offering fresh pasta, bread, pizza, and all, all your classic Italian pantry items, as well as hosting in-person pasta classes and dinners. Jess, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jess. I am the owner and chef of a Pasta Forever. Uh, we're located in Toronto, um, around like Dundas and Brock. Um, yeah, I've been a chef, a pasta chef for uh, about 10 years. When I started um, cooking professionally, I immediately was drawn to pasta. Uh, my family is Italian, so I kind of grew up around, around it, um, making it helping and like my Nona make it, I definitely wasn't, <laughs> wasn't very helpful as, as a child uh, in the kitchen, but have always been interested in it. Um, I, I think from there, um, we would have these like really big, um, like Italian style lunches every Sunday and you would kind of show up at noon and you would leave around five. Um, <laughs> so just like really bringing, bringing people together um, over, over food and what people I think don't really think about when they think about Italian food in the way that like it's it's morphed into our North American society is that it really is like truly peasant food it's it's not meant to be fancy it's not meant to be like small little portions plated with with um little tongs and things it's like these big long loud um family gatherings is like what is at the heart of of Italian food and cuisine um and the Italian food kind of is split between, or Italy in general, is split between the north and south of the country. And Rome is kind of what splits it. And the north, so Rome and north of it, um, were always like the richer regions of the country. Um, they had the space for the animal farms. Um, and so with that in and of itself, they had the access to dairy, to eggs, to protein. Um, which was something that in the South, they didn't have access to. They were the fishermen. Um, they didn't have animal farms where so that means that they don't have access to extra eggs just to put in like their pasta doughs. They don't have a ton of dairy. They don't have access to a lot of animal protein. Um, so they were kind of the poorer regions of the country. And that's where my family is from. And so the way that that impacts like pasta making and the cuisine of the country is that in the north, you end up having stuffed pastas, long noodles like tagliatelle, pappardelle, things that are made with dairy, things that are made with eggs. Um, they naturally grow double zero flour up in the north, which is what we all kind of assume is, is used for pasta. But in the south, they naturally grow uh, semolina flour. It's a wheat flour and it is higher naturally in protein. So you don't have to use eggs with it. You can just use water. Um, and they have a predominantly like fish heavy and vegetarian diet because most of the South like, is along the sea. Um, so they're mostly fishermen. And then in the landlocked regions in the center, you have a highly like vegetarian diet. Um, and so that's where my family is from. So all of these like lovely Southern shapes are, um, all shaped by hand. There's no real intricate um, machinery that's used or um, you don't need like the pasta roller. You don't need um, any of these like fancy little like shaping devices. Um, there's a couple of things you can use and most of those things can be replicated with things that you can find in, in your kitchen or in your home. Um, so it very much is things that are made with your hands. Um, and there's so many different shapes, simple things like cavatelli, 
um, which is a really common shape now. It kind of looks like a, like a little hot dog bun. And it's the first shape that I teach in my classes. Um, it's a really versatile one that kind of goes with all the sauces. It's an easy dough. It's easy to shape. Um, so you have things like cavatelli and capunti. And then you have even more simple things like peachy, which is kind of a long spaghetti and all you do is like roll a rope of dough um, and then you have very intricate things like lorquitas or colorjones um, that are eaten only for religious ceremonies or um, like a wedding like really special events um, where like you would have a big dinner um, so there's a really big variation of shapes that you can use from like just literally flour and water and your hands um, and so uh, last year, Mocha Toronto had an exhibit on. It was the Mika Rottenberg exhibit. Um, I was really lucky to be able to go and see it. It was in like um, uh, like a lockdown, one of our many lockdowns in Toronto. And I was really lucky to go and see it because I was like, wow, I haven't seen art in like a year. And I was so happy. Um, it was called the Spaghetti Blockchain Exhibit. And it was mostly inspired um, by interacting with matter and they wanted to do a class for it and so I had been teaching classes in person with people prior to COVID alongside working in restaurants and when um, COVID hit I kind of pivoted everything to like virtual and including classes and so then we were kind of left or I was up for the question what, like what do most people have in their kitchens you know, mixing bowls, maybe a wooden cutting board, obviously some forks. And literally with that, you can make pasta. Um, and you can make this like beautiful meal that kind of brings people together, which is one of the only things that we could really do in, in COVID. Um, and so for that exhibit or for that class with Mocha, we did Busiati, which is a set, uh, shape from Calabria. And it's shaped with um, a ferretto or a ferro. Um, but for this class, we just used a wooden skewer or I actually made it the other day and forgot all of my tools were at home. And so I used a pen. Um, <laughs> and so there's a lot of really um, amazing shapes that you can make and make this like beautiful pass a dinner for yourself or your family or your friends with like literally just things kind of found in your kitchen and with like the most minimal of ingredients. And I think that's like one thing that's really special about pasta and Italian food that I think sometimes we forget because we usually eat them in like fancy restaurants, but at the end of the day, it's all just peasant food bringing people together. And I think that's it for me. <laughs> All right, that was awesome. I loved everything. Okay, so I love pasta. I love Italian food. Love it. And this was very okay. So I'm supposed to talk about the questions, but I just want to talk about you guys for a second. Trevor, Rhonda, Noah, Jess. It was very eye-opening, especially with um the art and the food that Noah, I'm um, sorry, that Trevor and Rhonda are doing. Like that's really, really good. Um, I might have to check that out. So I'm going to check my calendar and see if I can make it down there. And Noah, uh, everything, pasta, everything. Great. So I have some questions for you guys. Sorry for you ladies and gentlemen. You know, we speak like how we, we were raised, right? Uh, okay. So for Noah, um, when the pandemic hit, where were you with your career? And could you describe how it affected you and how did you pivot? with that yeah I actually um I started in my um position at TPW as the director of TPW right at the very beginning of the pandemic um so I mean I was extremely fortunate to be able to start a new job in a pandemic um it was obviously extremely challenging to come into a new role in this kind of circumstance um we had our first in-person board meeting just the other day, actually, after two years, um, or over two years. So yeah, it's been, it's been incredibly challenging. And I think, um, like for everyone that kind of pivots are too many to name. Um, but, um, one thing I will say is that I think, well, actually our whole team at TPW started dur during the pandemic. We're an entirely new team and we all started working together during the pandemic. Um, and I think one of the things that's actually been 
um, a really important pivot for us is, and, and we're of course not alone in this, but a kind of slowing down. Um, we've cut back on programming significantly and we've really rethought the way that we're working with artists and audiences and our collaborators, um, moving away from a kind of um, more is more, um, you know, programming, um, operating methodology that is obviously very pervasive in the arts and just trying to slow things down. So I think that's actually been a very positive pivot um, to the kind of way that we're working and also trying to just resist um, the kind of art world grind that we're encouraged to, you know, kind of perpetuate. Um, and again, we're not alone in this. Many of our, especially fellow artist run centers have been sort of um, doing the same thing, which has been really, um, I think, uh, actually like an amazing thing to kind of move through and think through with these small teams. Right. So, yeah. Right. Okay, so um, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna ask you, so everyone's gonna get this question. Is summer in the city in Toronto is beautiful. What is your go-to thing to do, whether it be art or food? What is like the one thing that you have to do this summer? Um, such a hard question. <laughs> Okay. It should be easy, but it's so hard. Um, I, know, right? I like to go to all the places that Jess has worked at. Um, <laughs> that's one thing. Um, I think having, yeah, like my own deck, being with friends and family and sort of my own space is still feels like really precious, even though we're coming out of a pandemic. Um, and in terms of art, always my go-tos are artist front centers. So us at TPW, Mercer, Gallery 34. Um we're often doing really great programming throughout the summer. So those are, yeah, definitely go-tos. Okay. And then the last question for you, how would you bring art and food together for, with people? How would you do that? Yeah. I mean, I guess as a, I, the, I think the most straightforward way I can answer that question is just as a curator, my role is really a facilitator between sort of artists and audience. And so it's actually just my role to help kind of, artists realize their vision. Um, so yeah, I mean, the way that I do that is to sort of support artists um, and to help them do kind of, you know, the work that the important work that they're doing to um, think about food and think about public space and sharing and, and bring different publics together. So okay. yeah. <laughs> That's great, love it. Okay, so Rhonda and Trevor, um, I'm gonna ask so either one of you could answer, but I'm gonna go with the summer in the city. So you guys can answer that. So summer in the city in Toronto, what is your go-to? What? Oh, <laughs> what is your go-to for art or food? He's pointing at you, Rhonda. He's telling you. <laughs> as soon as you asked that, I, I knew right away. I was going to say, I, I just spent the last month living on Toronto Island at Artscape Developer Point. And on um, by Words Island, there's by the ferry, there's a place called Island, uh, Island Cafe, amazing food and just amazing experience. Um, you know, you see Toronto skyline. I think it's one of Toronto's best kept secrets is Island Cafe, what is, what is Ferry. Island Cafe. Island Cafe near the Words Island Ferry um, terminal on on Words Island. Okay. And Excellent food. You, okay. How about you, Trevor, on that one? Oh, to, uh, you, mute, Trevor. You, you. <laughs> okay. What I what I said was barbecues in the backyard. Definitely people over. I live in the, in uh, Etobicoke. I live near Centennial Park, and there's I actually love those big events they have. There's a rib fest, there's a jerk fest, and so on. I just I love these big events where people gather. Okay, okay. So now back to your your beautiful art, your DIYs with um, the community. Uh, when you create your DIYs, uh, have you? Well, I was gonna say my question was, have you uh, thought about incorporating food as an expression? But clearly, you do. So. <laughs> How did you come about doing that? Like, what was the, how, how, how did that idea come about for you to incorporate food with your art? Um, I think I started running the first food uh, related art workshops when I did a residency in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, at Branscombe House where I just wanted to get people in the door to, to be creative. And I found, I'm a sculptor and trying to get people to do sculpture that haven't done it before is a lot harder than saying, hey, let's do some casting with chocolates. I've had these free workshops and you say, you know, free casting chocolate clips and then, you know, people just come running. <laughs> so that was the beginning. And uh, we've done a lot of different ones. I did also, we're interested in the history of food. We did one on uh, marzipan, it's a thousand year old history. 
um, across cultures. And then, you know, people make marzipan, sculpt the marzipan. Um, Trevor, did you want to add anything to? And I just think like a lot of our work is about archiving and making a record of the world, a kind of slice of what's there at a certain moment. And, uh, you know, uh, food is, is so, you know, uh, such a great topic. It's culturally, you know, interesting. And it's, uh, it's how people interact and, and it shows status. It shows different, um, you know, different uh, aspects of, of society. So for us, it's a very interesting topic. This is a in terms of documenting. I love it. It's like a time capsule. Yeah. <laughs> with, uh, with food. And I like how you said um, with the open KFC box, it had like a little bit of fries. I was eating a piece of chicken. You said there could be flies around there or whatever, right? So that was like really cool. I like that. Should have a seagull though, because you know the <laughs> seagulls are always around. <laughs> there probably right? was real seagulls at some point. <laughs> right. Okay. So my last question for the two of you, and either one of you can answer. So the question is, how did you pivot your business when COVID hit? Um, in the last two years or even more so in the last year? Because the first year I know everything was hard for everybody, but how was it the last year? Can I answer that one, Rhonda? Is yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, okay. um, You know, actually our practice is always changing. It's a bit of a mess and that's the kind of the way we like it. And uh, we're always unraveling everything we're doing and putting it in a different context and hoping it changes. And actually the pandemic was just in a way business as usual as far as we work. We started working online. We started doing a lot of outdoor projects and actually we really, uh, that drives us and makes us excited uh, to have a different context and situation. We always, that's why we like public space because there's something to work against and in that you cannot control. Right. I love it. I love it. Okay. So um, as you spoke about Jerk Fest, I'm actually going to be one of the demonstrators at Jerk uh -huh. Fest. So hopefully you could come. It's on the, I'm there on the Saturday. Go any of the, go every day. I'll be there on the Saturday demonstrating. So, okay. <laughs> um, so Jess, I'm going to start with you. Okay. So when COVID hit, you spoke about it already, kind of in your bio, but when it hit, how did it affect you and your career? Cause you were working with other people, but I read the bio, but if you can just briefly give us another little bit from your words, how it affected you and how you had to pivot. Yeah. Um, so I was working in, for Woodlot restaurant uh, when the when the pandemic hit and I kind of worked in restaurants for years um, and it wasn't just that I was out of a job it's just that the my, my entire industry crumbled before my eyes um, and I just started offering uh, to deliver pasta to like my Instagram followers which at the time weren't that many it was like my friends um but we were all kind of isolating because we didn't know what to do and so I was like I can porch drop some meals to people um and it just kind of kept going and and it hasn't ever really stopped um and was it, was it hard was it hard for you to pivot from leaving Woodlot and starting your um delivery and making pasta was that hard for you to do that you know I think <laughs> it I think like looking back, it was really hard. In the moment, it was kind of like, okay, well, um, I don't think to do, so I'll just, I'll just offer this. And I think I never really had time off to really think about it or plan a business. It kind of just started one day with the one post and it has not stopped, um, and which is like amazing and also, ter <laughs> also terrifying. But um, so it's been hard trying to pivot as other businesses have emerged and like trying to keep up with things, but it was never really a, like, I sit down, like, okay, I've lost my job, let's sit down and figure out something new. It was just at this ball that just has, has kept rolling and kept rolling and trying to um, continuously kind of pivot and expand in the next way that makes sense for us. Right. Okay. So then now I'm going to hit you with the summer in the city. <laughs> what is your go-to thing for okay. art or food? I, I, um, I know you're going to come with something great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I We just finished doing Dundas West Fest. And uh, I think as Trevor just said, it was so nice to see so many people gather, especially after 
two, two and a half years now of not having crowds. Um, it was a lot. And also it was like so great to see so many people. Um, so probably I'll be at a bunch of like food festivals, but also I live in Parkdale. And so I tend to stay in my, in my neighborhood a lot. So I like oh, to there's go- a lot of things going on in Parkdale. Parkdale is amazing. So I go to Logos Corner a lot, eat a lot of dumplings. Um, La Phoenix has a really good back patio. I go to a lot. Happy Coffee and Wine has a great back patio. Um, and I'm hosting a lot of back patio di- dinners at my work also. So I'll be doing a lot of patio stuff. Okay. This okay. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm going to do some quick fire questions for you guys. So I'm going to go with Noah. So I'm going to just do like three or four for each one of y'all. Okay. So Noah, food on a skewer or food on a tiny spoon? Oh, a skewer. Okay. <laughs> Buffet or sit down dinner? Uh, sit down dinner. Butter or olive oil? Both. <laughs> ah, okay. And last one, what do you prefer? Chicken breast or chicken thighs? Oh, thighs. Okay. Is that even a question? Sorry. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> Sorry to anyone who answers differently. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Trevor, food on a skewer or food on a tiny spoon? Mute, mute, mute. <laughs> skewer. <laughs> okay. Breakfast for dinner or dinner for breakfast? Uh, breakfast for dinner. All right. Lobster or steak? Steak. Waffles or pancakes? Uh, pancakes. My wife makes really good ones. Okay. All right. Rhonda, food on a skewer or food on a tiny spoon? Skewer. All right. Um, cake or pie? Cake. Definitely cake. <laughs> My favorite food. <laughs> right? <laughs> what would... No, I'm going to ask you guys that after. Hot sauce or barbecue sauce? Hot sauce. All right. And butter or olive oil? Butter. All right. Jess. Mm -hmm. Butter or olive oil? Depends on the food it's going with. Okay. Okay. Food on a skewer or food on a tiny spoon? Skewer. All right. Um, Besides Toronto, what is your favorite place or city? Oh God. Uh, Puglia in Italy, the heel of Italy. I'm going in August. Can't wait to go oh, back. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Okay, I'm going to ask you all this one question. What is your favorite kitchen gadget? Go, Jess. A fish spatula. Rhonda? Pass. <laughs> I got to think about it. <laughs> Robert? I have an omelet pan that I use incessantly. I love it. Okay. Noah, favorite kitchen gadget? Yeah, it's hard. Um, yeah, I was, I'm going to steal Trevor's a bit. Um, like a cast iron pan. Okay. Yeah. All right. Rhonda? Microplane. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and now everyone, what would your last meal be? Go Rhonda. Um, birthday cake. <laughs> <laughs> what flavor? What kind? What kind? Oh, well, I like Safeway. You know, I don't know if you know what Safeway is, but it's a grocery store out West. Safeway yeah. birthday cake. <laughs> last right? meal. You think you she's lying. She's telling the truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what's yours, Trevor? I don't know. At the moment, I'm going to say a Nashville chicken sandwich, but I don't really know. Okay. How about you, Noah? What's your, your last meal? What would it be? Um, I want to say something better than this, but ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Jess, what would your last favorite meal be? Uh, mine is a plate of cavatelli with tomato sauce and parm that's been like, like blitzed up, not microplaned, that my Nona made for me. <laughs> Ooh, delish, delish. Um, I'll take okay. that as well. <laughs> right? Okay. Change mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so a question uh, from YouTube. I have a baker friend who says, all food is political, meaning all of our values are expressed in our food choices. Noah's project. Oh, wait, hold on. What is this? <laughs> I just started reading. Okay, Noah's project and and Rhonda and Trevor's work remind me that food is sometimes a great entry to more difficult ideas for discussion. Can you speak a bit more to your playful food practices as a platform for serious exploring of dynamics and food systems? Any one of you three, go ahead. Trevor, you're unmiked, so you can go with that. Oh, okay. Um, I think for us, it's a little bit about access. 
And I think, uh, you know, our projects are a lot about access and uh, things happening in, in places that uh, anyone might stumble upon them. And there's an entry point that anyone can kind of uh, relate to or understand or have a kind of almost expertise. Actually, it's interesting to me to have a project wherein people come up to me and they say, oh, you know, I said, I made this roast beef, for example, at this conversation in Corktown. I said, I made a, a roast beef. And this guy, my neighbor gave me the recipe and she goes, oh, well, how did he do it? And I, I told her, and he goes, well, that's not how you do it. She said, I use this, 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 and this, right? And it was all this kind of cultural knowledge and, and, and also just a kind of opinion. And it was a kind of power this person had that they brought to the, the event and they were sharing with me. And I think a lot of our work, the basic idea is that we're, we are a host, we're hosting people, but we're a guest. And I think that balance uh, for us is why food is such a great, you know, it's a potluck, it's public art, it's a potluck. Right, right. Do you have anything to add to that, Noah? Just, yeah, I mean, I really echo um, what Trevor's saying. And I think, yeah, that the idea of food being an entry point is so important and that it is highly politicized uh, it, or it's political, it's inherently political. And I think the conversations around food are inseparable from kind of wider politics in which, you know, they're taking place um, either in kind of private or public or semi-public spaces. Um, but I think be because of the nature of food and our kind of collective relationships to food, um, and I also just want to acknowledge also sometimes to food insecurity, not just to food, but to food insecurity, um, is, is a way to um, actually open up. It's just a way to open up the conversation um, and to um, not just make it accessible, but I think make it translatable, you know, across, across the arts, not so outside of the arts. So but I'm just repeating everything Trevor said. So yes, agreed. <laughs> okay. And, okay. So Jess, um, you can touch on that as well because you did mention that Italian food is like a peasant, it's like peasant meal and uh, the different kinds of wheat. So that is, you know, a discussion that we have over food. And I learned something about the kind of pastas I eat is mostly from the South. I didn't know that. So <laughs> who knew? Yeah, who knew? Um, yeah, Southern, Southern, uh, Food in Italy, in Italy, very um, like peasant food, very budget friendly, um, just minimal ingredients. It's always working with like the seasons and like what what you have available to you at that moment. Um, I think that we're seeing a real um, like political food moment now with the inflation of, of food prices and not just as a business owner, am I saying that? And like the, the very small margin that there is for um, food entrepreneurs and food businesses to make it in this time right now, but also just as a consumer, as someone who buys, buys groceries in living in a city, um, accessibility to food, um, I think is the real issue that, that really needs to be addressed kind of, a globally, but also just in our in our own um, societies and neighborhoods. All right, uh, awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you, everyone, for um, participating. Uh, the next one will be on July thirteenth, same time at five p.m., and it will be the second of two panel discussions setting the table. Um, right here it says rumor has it it will be able it will be able to have it do it in person so stay tuned so in person instead of on zoom i would love that and um yeah so thank you all again Rhonda, trevor noah and jess this was really great even for me i hope everyone on youtube enjoyed it because i sure did so <laughs> so thank you thank you thanks for having us thank you